Ludicrous Feed is proudly sponsored by Car Loop Data and Cobra Car Insurance. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. Today I'm reviewing the Abarth 500E thanks to Stellantis Australia. Let's go check it out. All right, so let's go through the pricing and the specs for the Abarth 500E here in Australia, starting at $58,900, which is actually $6,400 more expensive than the Fiat 500E, which starts at $52,500. Pretty much the same size as the 500E, it's uh, five centimeters uh, longer. Uh, zero to 100 in seven seconds, it's got a front wheel drive powertrain, 114 kilowatts of power, 235 newton meters of torque, a 42 kilowatt hour traction battery, uh, NMC chemistry, usable 37.8 kilowatt hours with a WLTP range of uh, 265 kilometers or thereabouts, depending on what you read. We'll talk about that a bit later on about real world range. Charging 11 kilowatts AC, 85 kilowatts DC, which is a bit on the slow side. Again, I'll talk about that later on. It's got a uh, three year, 150,000 kilometer warranty here in Australia and eight year, 160,000 kilometer traction battery warranty as well. So what makes the Arbath the Arbath over the Fiat? A bit faster, of course. The Fiat is zero to 100 in nine seconds. And of course, a lot of uh, cosmetic improvements making it more fun to drive very sporty on the road and there it is the Arbath 500e in poison blue here in australia all right let's take a look at some of the finer details of the Arbath so some of the badging here there's the Arbath logo with the scorpion emblem you'll see the scorpion motif throughout the car as i walk around it some more there's the Arbath and I like that white trim down the bottom here, just below the intake. Nice headlights, make it look like a couple of eyes looking at you. The mirrors don't fold in, unfortunately. Got side indicators here. More of the uh, Scorpion motif on the wheels there. These are Bridgestone tires, 18 inch, and apparently these are diamond cut alloys as well. So there are 1,949 Scorpionissima variants, which have the Arbath badging on the side of the car. Limited edition. Some more Scorpion emblems here on the side. You'll see that on the inside as well of the car. Nice little 500 there. More Arbath badging on the back. More of this white trim below as well. Small little diffuser, makes it look a bit sportier. Lots of ultrasonic sensors throughout the car as well. Okay, let's have a look at the charge port. Push to open. Both Type 2 and DC components covered. Uh, some status lights there. Let's cover them back up. Close up. And some more 500 uh, badging here as well. All right, we'll do the old door open and close test. So these are like uh, electronic door handles. Open up. Pretty wide door, actually. Yeah, reasonable door closing sound. And this is what the key fob looks like. More 500 badging. Usual lock, unlock, boot, lights. And I'll just lock it for you, because you, one thing I noticed that you can't actually tell that's locked apart from the lights flashing. So you saw the light flashing there, but there's no like, you know, click to tell you the doors are locked. That's the kind of trigger I like to have to sort of give me the assurance that the car is locked. Um, just have to trust the car that it's locked or unlocked because you can't really even test because there's um, door proximity unlock as well. Cause you walk up close to the door handle to check, it'll open as well. So you just have to put the key somewhere else um, and then test that it's locked, if that's your thing. Anyway, um, nice to have that door proximity lock and unlock with the key fob. Okay, let's walk through the uh, door handle. So because these are electronic door locks, that's a, uh, just a button to open, a bit like the Model 3. Proudly made in Torino, Italy. Uh, mirror controls here, and electronic window opening. Down here you've got the emergency latch 
for opening the door just in case. Very small storage down here and six JBL speakers throughout the car. More Arbath badging down here too. There's the 500 floor mat, sporty pedals, another Arbath logo down here and then just the manual uh, levers for adjusting your seat and the same with the uh, lever down here as well to adjust the seat back and forward. If you want to access the very small second row, there is a pull handle here for both seats. And there it is. I reckon you can probably fit a pre-teen in the back here because, yeah, it's very, very tight. I'm not even going to try to get in there. I injured my back this week, so if I got in, I probably won't be able to get out and then just push the seat back. You can hear that click. Nice sporty seats, more Scorpion uh, emblem. Oh, bath here as well. You can probably just see the Scorpion here as well. Alcantara soft fabric, mix with a different material on the side. Let's quickly open the boot. You see a little camera there. And very small parcel shelf. Just another view of the second row in there. Very, very tight as you can see. That lifts up, 50-50 split. Child seat anchor points in the back. You can also see isofix anchor points on the seat itself at the front. And more of the Scorpion emblem on the seats itself too on the back row. And really not much storage in the boot at all. There's a light there to help you in the dark. And it does come with a Type 2 cable. Can't see the uh, slower 10 amp charger. There is a tyre repair kit here too. No extra storage down here. And just manual pull down lift gate. Uh, privacy glass for the second row. Of course, it's only a two door, or well, three door car, I should say. Now, from memory, when I reviewed the Fiat 500E, there was a latch in the footwell of the front passenger seat to open the bonnet. I can see the icon there, so let's pull this down here. Of course, no storage down here. Okay, so I'm by no means a big guy, but even I find this car a bit small. <laughs> it's definitely not a family vehicle by any means. It's very much designed only for two people, and I guess occasionally carrying around two small people in the back, or at a stretch, very short distance for two other adults in the back. But still, nevertheless, a very fun car to drive. Let's go through the interior now. Okay, so when you start the car up like this, so brake pedal on, and then there's a power button here. So that turns on the electronics of the car, and then to actually start driving, uh, push the start button again once you push down the brake pedal. Listen to this. <laughs> Guitar riff to get things going. And then when you turn it off, yeah, bit of fun, right? All right, so let's go through the interior. So you've got uh, some nice Alcantara here in the front, uh, just surrounding the um, cluster screen as well as the infotainment screen. What I don't like, however, is that there are some uh, cheaper plastics, harder plastics around the top of the vehicle here and also lining the edges of the car, which is slightly disappointing. Down here, however, it's a bit nicer, a bit softer materials. I like the double stitching there with the yellow and the blue. Again, some more hard plastics down here. And same with down here as well, a bit harder plastics. There, and across the front here as well, unfortunately. This chrome trim kind of breaks it up a little bit. Steering wheel seems okay, softer materials here, nice to touch. A bit softer here as well, it's not too bad. I like the fact that there is a, uh, a mesh cover here for the glass roof. And that does make a difference on a hot day which, as you can see, can be easily retracted just to the middle of the car there and then latches easily there as well. Traditional mirror and normal visors which don't extend. No mirror on the driver's side. Uh, there is a mirror on the passenger side. At the top here, got uh, light switches and that's about it. Might turn the AC on, it's getting a bit stuffy in here. Um, speaking of the AC, all the buttons here are basically for the AC. Pretty standard controls there. And then you've got a wireless charging platform here. 
again. I think that is the skyline of Turin or Torino in Italy. Um, USB A charger there. Wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto as well. Gear controls down here. I'll show you that on our drive later on. Uh, left hand indicate, as you can see, being European, of course. Um, auto lights. And on the right hand side, we've got wiper controls, uh, rain sensing wipers, and there's also rear wiper controls too. Air conditioning vents throughout the car, one on this side, and then across the front, and then the one on the passenger side. And then more buttons here on the driver's side for fog lamps and to adjust the headlights as well. You can also turn the sensors off if you need, and same with stability control. More Scorpion badging, Arbath logo on the steering wheel, horn in the middle, extra bit of detail here as well on the steering wheel, and we'll go through the uh, steering wheel controls a bit later on. In the middle we've got a lock switch and hazard lights. Down here in the center you've got a cup holder there, which you can hide away like this, and then bring down again quite easily. Volume control, um, drive modes, you can adjust from here, park brake, a bit more storage down here. So you've got another USB-A port, I've got a converter here but this is a USB-C port, 12 volt plug there, a bit more storage down here, there's a cup holder there, and then this can be slid across like that to cover it up for privacy. Um, extra storage down here too. And this armrest is movable, like this. Oh, and heated seats as well, which is a nice touch for both seats in the front row. Okay, so let's go through the infotainment screen. What's nice is that you can save uh, all your settings to a profile. It's also a valet mode as well. And as I said, wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, which can be selected very quickly from this screen. There it is. So it's nice to have the Apple CarPlay controls here, but then the car controls can be easily accessed uh, on this side as well, which is a nice touch. Turn the screen off there. Let's go to the electric vehicle settings. So you can see the power flow, driving history, schedules for charging. So I said 11 kilowatts AC, three phase charging. And you can adjust the uh, charging level as well. I don't think you can control the uh, battery level, so it will always charge to 100% if you let it, but you can decrease the charging speed, for AC anyway. So performance, see the battery level, 12 volt battery working away there. Um, and you can drag race as well, so you can time your run, and then all the settings are here too. Change your profile. Um, pretty good safety features. Automatic and emergency braking, lane sense, traffic sign assist, which you will we'll see on our drive later on. And also driver alert warnings as well. There's also blind spot alerts. There's voice control, navigation options, and yes, there is inbuilt nav, reverse camera, and rain sensing wipers. Lock settings. You can turn that passive entry off too if you wanted to. Auto brakes. Oh, hold and go. Yeah, I like that. I couldn't find that before. So there you go. I learned something new. That's the um, auto hold. Yeah, lots of settings to play with. Oh, software updates. Yes, we might as well get some updates over Wi Fi. And system information. License information. Oh, a web browser here. Wow. Well, so I'm just playing with the trip planner, just to see whether there is any EV trip planning. Um, the navigation is actually very slow. It's taking a long time to work out how to get to Melbourne. Uh, recharging needed to reach your destination. Uh, yes. Include smart ICs and more. Okay. You will arrive at your destination at 18.48. Recharger needed to reach your destination. Yes, let's search for chargers. Oh, look. All the chargers along the route. Show stations along the way. Interesting. It doesn't actually tell you where to stop, right? So that that is why EV trip planning is important, which I don't think it shows, sadly. Although, look, it does say you're going to run out at this point here. 
So it does give you options to charge before that. That's something. So you can add a stop like that. Look, that's probably better than I've seen in previous my reviews I've done in other cars. It's not perfect, but it does at least go that one step more and show you that this is your current range with your car, with its current state of charge. See, this is how far you can travel. Interesting. And that's where you're going to basically die, or at least where the car's going to die if you don't charge up beforehand. Okay, that's something at least. And then the usual media sources, radio, Apple CarPlay. Now because Apple CarPlay is so handy, I've just been running all my audio uh, and maps, including ways through Apple CarPlay. Now as an alternative to EV trip planning, there is an app called ABRP or a Better Route Planner. Now this is what you can use if you have a premium subscription to ABRP, you can load it up on Apple CarPlay like this. So you can actually map out where you need to stop. Now I won't run through ABRP in its entirety today, but stay subscribed with me on the channel and I'll run through ABRP in a future video with my BYD seal to show you how it works. So stay tuned. Okay, so back with the steering wheel controls, there's a manual lever here to adjust your steering wheel. And you can see behind the steering wheel, there's actually controls for volume on the right side, up and down, and also a mute button. And on the left side as well, you can choose between the different sources for your audio. Okay, so let's go through the steering wheel and drive cluster controls. So right hand side is all for cruise control, which I'll go through in my drive later on. And then on the left side, you've got voice activation and phone controls and also menu buttons here. So let's go through that right now. So first screen is the uh, uh, speedometer. So up and down, two different ways to look at it. Power and regen, circular or more linear with this view. And on this side you've got battery state of charge and current estimated range remaining, temperature, current time, and odometer as well. And then you can change the different drive modes here too. So I've been driving pretty much exclusively on Scorpion track mode, which is like as sporty as it gets with this car. But if you put your foot on the brake and then use these controls down here with my left hand, you can change what mode you want. So from Scorpion track mode, you can go to Scorpion Street, and then Turismo, which is kind of a more eco mode. Scorpion Street is kind of more normal, and Scorpion Track. And as we go for a drive, I can show you that Scorpion Track is very sporty, and you basically feel every pump on the road. Suspension's a bit stiffer, as is the handling. And look, let's face it, why would you buy this car if not for a sportier feel? That's why I've been trying to drive it on Scorpion Track all week. And you can see the gauges change as well if you change between the different modes. It's a nice little touch for that view as well. Nice. Okay, so that's the trip consumption. So I've been averaging around 17.5 to 18 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers on Scorpion Track mode. Not terribly efficient, but let's be honest again, you don't really buy this car for efficiency. You buy it for fun. So 18 kilowatt hours for a 37.8 kilowatt hour battery, you're looking at uh, about 200 kilometers of real world range, which should be enough for most day-to-day -day driving around the city. But uh, for the lifetime of this car, uh, most journos have been averaging around 16.3 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers, given this is a press car, which is more in line with the uh, stated WLTP range. It's driver assist, tire pressure gauges, sources, navigation screen, still trying to get me to Melbourne, stored messages, and then settings as well you can play with. So when the car is stationary, there's more options. So screen setup, you can play with that. Electric features, ready to drive pop-up, power charge. External sound is interesting, so listen to this. Yeah, you can actually hear that, right? If I open the door, yeah, that's really quite noisy. So I might turn that off. It's a little bit embarrassing, actually. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure I've ever had that on, to be honest. Uh, but if that's to your liking, that's something you can play with. I wonder if that changes as you drive around. Tutorial, dimmer, reset trip B, C navigation. Safety assistance, buzzer volume. All right, everyone, well, that's a quick walkthrough of the uh, Abarth 500E. 
So let's now go for a real drive on real roads. Let's do this. All right, let's head off on our drive. And I'm on Scorpion track mode, which is like their sport mode. And I'm going to put it on that noise just to show you what it's like with it on. There we go. Display, electric features. There we go. We'll let that rumble. And all right. Away we go. Let's do this. see whether it changes pitch as we get faster as well. I'm not sure much to the amusement of other people. Ooh, a bit of torque steering. Being a front wheel drive vehicle. That's not ground up EV of course. Turn left here. Okay, oh, it does rev. Feels like I'm driving an ice car now, particularly because it's um, so tight on the suspension uh, and the handling. Can I feel the rumbling? Not really. I can just hear it, so there's no vibration as such. Still pretty comfortable, right? That's um, Scorpion track mode. Now, I can only change the drive mode when I'm stopped. So let's see if I switch it to Scorpion Street, same noise. Scorpion Turismo, so same noise as well. So we might as well leave it on Scorpion track. There we go. It's pretty noisy. I might wind the windows down. Still kind of hear it externally as well. Pretty amusing. Yeah, what do you guys think about that? An EV making um, making fake engine noises, what do you think? Will that help people transition over from ICE to EV? Or will that just make it worse? I'm still kind of in two minds about it. I mean, look, the whole point of this car is to have fun, right? Like, people generally aren't going to buy this car for you know, there are said environmental reasons or even for economy or efficiency. It's going to be fun. It's going to be, you know, uh, a joy to drive, handling through small streets, that kind of thing. But kind of still want to do the right thing for pollution, I guess, tailpipe emission. Definitely cannot accelerate out of a curve too much, too much torque vectoring. Third or something, right? Equivalent of. Does it change gear or shift up as I go faster? Well, it just keeps revving up. It'd be nice if it was um, like shifting up, right? Mm. It is very noisy. You probably hear that. Um, oh, well, I might as well try cruise control while I'm here. Let's um, pop that on. So, cruise on there. Set. 80. It's got some element of uh, lane centering or auto steer. Though it just tends to ping pong. So, you know, it'll reach the edge of the, the lane and then sort of veer your back rather than just keeping it in the center. But it's not really true auto steer as such. It's more kind of an advanced lane keeping function. See, watch this. If I let go, finds the edge of the lane and then brings me back. It keeps sort of finding the edge to bring me back. Whereas other auto steer, like for example Tesla's autopilot, it'll keep you right in the center of the lane, generally speaking. Wow, it's just going at high revs. Crazy. Or well, feels like it's going at high revs. Let's cancel. It doesn't feel like it's downshifting either. So just, just reducing the revs on whatever it is, first or second view, equivalent. 
Yeah. Alright, well that's kind of a brief taste of cruise. I'll keep driving then um, I'll put it back on uh, a bit later on. Okay, so now you can watch me navigate all the roadworks uh, on the Bradfield Highway or whatever expressway, whatever you want to call it, on the approach to the Sydney Harbour Bridge as we I head across the harbour. And uh, the road quality is not very good. And I can tell you now, I can feel pretty much every bump on the road, uh, given the sport suspension. Come to this lane. And stay on this side. Now with the, um, the engine noise off, you can hear the true road noise coming through. What do you think? It's not too bad, but you know, given a small car, there won't be too much insulation, of course. Another bump. Again, I don't think would be taking this uh, car too often on a road trip I would think because one the range is just not great like 200 kilometers you're going to charge very often and secondly the charging DC charging speed is so slow like 85 kilowatts I know it's only a small battery I suppose that's one thing so that sort of counters that I'm going to have to cut into this right lane somehow Excuse me, everyone. I'm going to use my speed a little bit to get in. Okay, now we're in the French lane. Yeah, if anyone's ever driven around this part of Sydney, it's just, uh, it's interesting, even for a uh, seasoned driver, a seasoned Sydney driver, there's still a lot of road work going on. Got to make a decision pretty quickly. Yeah, as I was saying, we probably won't take this too often on a road trip. And the third reason is that there's not much storage, of course, in the back. So this is really very much a, an inner city car, or an urban vehicle, I would think. Short range, zippy enough to get through lanes, small enough to park easily on side streets. I mean, you know, Places like places in the inner city of Sydney certainly have, don't have much off-street parking, and therefore not much off-street charging. But a small car like this should be able to find parking more often than not. Squeeze into small spaces because just got to find a small or well, somewhere to charge your vehicle if you don't have any off-street parking. And then time it with your uh, weekly shopping run or whatever it is you do once a week. Sydney Harbour Bridge. Uh, look, it handles pretty well on the on the major road like this, especially with cruise function. Turn it on. Just tap up and down for one kilometer an hour increments, and then hold it down for like ten kilometers an hour. Changes. As I said before, the efficiency is not something. And look at this. It doesn't really have active cruise control. I, if I don't stop, I'm going to ram straight into the car ahead of me. And this is the setting I haven't set up yet, but i to be very careful. Hopefully it's just the setting I haven't done yet, but yeah, just be very careful. If um, active cruise control is not activated. I'm certainly not set up. Alright, just exiting the Harbour Bridge. Uh, then you can watch me head on to the Anzac Bridge. And we'll find some small streets around the inner city to navigate around. Shame not to drive through showy parts of Sydney. 
Okay, just approaching the um, Anzac Bridge now. Just want to make a point here with um, Apple CarPlay and Waze that I've got running at the moment. Some vehicles like the Fiat and the Arbath, for example, you can drag and slide the map around like this, no problem. But then in other cars, for example, like BYD Seal, you can't do this. You've got to use the, um, the controls to get around. So, yeah, I, I don't know why some cars have that and others don't. Then you can just recenter like this. But just, uh, just a little note there. So if anyone from BYD or MG is watching, why is it that's, uh, that your Waze or Google Maps doesn't allow you to slide the map around like this? Okay, drive on. Might as well put cruise on for a bit. And the uh, speedo is calibrated to two to three kilometers an hour slower if you trust the GPS speed on the ways there compared to my speedometer down here. Again, with a small car and uh, having so many big cars around you, sometimes I do feel a bit unprotected. I can see the appeal of driving a big car, particularly when every car seems to be getting bigger on our roads. So yes, a bit exposed. Driving a small car like the Bath. It's the only downside to driving this in Sydney. I mean if every every car was small that wouldn't be a problem I suppose. But the trend is for cars to be getting bigger. Whether you like it or not. Alright, so that is the Anzac Bridge done. Uh, let's try to find some smaller roads around the inner parts of Sydney to drive the Arbath around. Okay, so now we are approaching a part of Sydney with tighter roads and laneways and narrow streets. So here is our chance to give it a good test around these parts. There we go, I've got my first narrow lane. One isn't too bad. Still pretty tight. Let's see whether we can turn left again. Oh yes. Not super tight. Still. Conceivably somewhere you might need to navigate down. The park. Imagine if there were cars parked on either side, right? Now, I need to turn right here. This could be tricky. This could be a narrow way. Very difficult. Right turn. This is where the torque steering might not be a good thing. Kind of feel that a little bit. Okay. To a main road. Another narrow street. Yeah, well. This one's quite colourful. what you need right a small car like this to get through squeeze through and then another little tight bit here at the van oh poor Audi seen better days under this road. All right, well, uh, I think that's our fun for today. Showing you some examples of driving on main roads and normal streets and then some extra tight streets with the Arbath 500E. So many thanks to Slantis Australia for loaning us this vehicle. Again, who would buy this car? Well, uh, look, I'll be honest, not someone like me. I have a lot of responsibilities still in my life. 
I need a bigger car to go to work and occasionally ferry the kids around. Uh, go on road trips, so yeah, with luggage in the back. So this is a car I would say for someone who is a bit more unencumbered than me. Uh, less responsibilities. This could be a second or third car. Uh, two people, someone with their partner, to feel free to drive around, feeling good about themselves. Not a bad thing. Don't need to carry anything in the boot. Don't need that much range if you're just zipping around town. Or just maybe on a quick day trip somewhere. And yeah, I think this is uh, this is good if you don't want to pay for petrol or if you uh, you know just want to charge up at home. Pretty convenient to have. Again, yeah, with a price tag of around sixty thousand dollars, probably more with on roads. One of the competition uh, on the market. So you've got uh, Mini Cooper. It's electric Mini Cooper. Um, what's on the horizon? Maybe something like the BYD. Seagull or the Dolphin Mini, some other smaller cars coming to the market. Um, for this price range, 60000 you could easily buy a Tesla, or almost buy a Tesla Model 3, definitely buy a BYD Seal. So it's still a lot of money for what you can get with this vehicle, but you know, if uh, a smaller car is what you need to zip around, then this might be an option. And why buy this over a Fiat 500e? Well, this is a bit faster. Bit zippier, uh, it's got custom, oh sorry, cosmetic upgrades to make it look a bit more fun, a bit more sporty, and the engine noise is uh, kind of cute and fun as well. So, there you go, uh, my summary on uh, uh, why you would uh, buy this R Bath 500 e But uh, for everyone else, thank you so much for watching uh, my video today, just my quick summary and uh, opinion on this car. Feel very fortunate to be able to drive cars like this to test so thanks for watching until the next ludicrous feed video happy charging